Thank you, Arvid. Uh, very delayed to be here. Let me try to pull up my, my presentation here. Uh, if I put it into full screen, is it going to work for everybody? How's that look? All right, I'm gonna go. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you. Uh, Tom Rondo, I'm a program manager at DARPA. I've been there for six years, uh, so quite a long time. For those who know DARPA, we usually cycle in and out pretty quickly, uh, but I've been able to use this time to advance a lot of the, the technologies uh, that we use behind software defined radio uh, and what we're terming here, you know, I, I like to talk about programming the electromagnetic spectrum. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, pull out a, an old tweet from a friend of mine, Ben Hilburn, um, that there are four fundamentals of the uh, force of the universe and we get to program one of them at home. Uh, so that's what we've been, been talking about is, uh, is manipulating uh, this force, the electromagnetic force uh, as our core uh, capabilities by building software, uh, programming it. Uh, so writing uh, Python code that in you know uh, 30 seconds you can start actually transmitting or receiving over the RF waves uh, and and manipulating those, those uh, signals through uh, the Fourier transforms which um, I uh, are near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, we can go into that later. Uh, how near and dear, but uh, um, but we've made it easier by by building programming frameworks around it. Uh, specifically, the GNU radio project uh, was one that I worked on for many years. Uh, it helped me get my dissertation finished and my PhD. Uh, and then I took over as the maintainer of the, the code base for, uh, for six years before coming to DARPA uh, and using the platform at DARPA to uh, expand uh, our capabilities and building new technologies uh, behind it. So let's dive into what this programming of the electromagnetic force really means. Uh, so I, I, I'm a bit of a, a history buff, especially history of science and radio. And there's a there's a much more detailed version of this chart, but uh, I'm just putting it up here now for uh, for the sake of time to try to hit the highlights of the history of uh, of radio mixed with a history of computing science. Uh, and so what I what I love about this is how they uh, this interesting trends that you find when you look at the um, when you look at the, the these two uh, uh, timelines here. Uh, starting in the mid 19th century, uh, you have some of the, the fundamental breakthroughs in both, uh, both uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of these two worlds. Um, you've got the, uh, you know, the kind of the invention of computing science with uh, Ada Lovelace and, and Charles Babbage, uh, but you Tom, also have Maxwell. Yeah? Tom, yeah, can, I think your slides are not advancing. So. I was afraid of that. Am I, are you just seeing the... Uh... The first slide. Ah, shoot, yes. Okay, so if I... If ah, I now it's good. Yep, yeah. 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 Well, that ruins the joke of the uh, of the tweet. <laughs> no worries. The universe. So here, here's the tweet that I was referencing at the beginning. Um, yeah. So here's the timeline. This is this is where I really wanted to uh, to hit. Um, so you can starting with with Ada uh, and and uh, Ada Lovelace and their work uh, and Maxwell, the breakthroughs in uh, Maxwell's equations that really. Uh, helped us understand uh, empirically how the universe worked when, it, uh, when we talk about the electromagnetic force. Uh, that rolls in quickly. And, and what I love about this, uh, this chart here is the way that I've tried to design it to show uh, this dilation around the invention of the transistor and the transistor radio and computers. So you have early on some amazing work done in the RF field, in the radio field, to create the, the, the fundamental breakthroughs for how we understand how we, we uh, engage with the electromagnetic spectrum. Meanwhile, the computing field, I think, you know, there, there, weren't, there weren't terribly many theoretical breakthroughs. I'm not talking about engineering. I'm talking about theoretical science and uh, theoretical breakthroughs for how we, we control these systems. Uh, the Turing machine, uh, Alan Turing's dissertation uh, and the work that he therefore then did in uh, World War II is of course a, a big one, the creation of the first elect all electrical computer, the ENIAC. But what I, what's fascinating to me about this is the transistor, right? The transistor was built as a device to amplify signals. It was to, to replace vacuum tubes as, a, uh, as an amplifier, not as a compute uh, logic uh, device. Uh, but it was quickly realized that if you can uh, use this as an amplifier, you can also use it as a switch. Uh, and I'll also point to, uh, I was pointing here to Shannon's dissertation, his actually his uh, uh, master's dissertation, considered one of the, the most impactful in the world, uh, 
telling us how to use Boolean algebra to use switches to, to compute numbers, Boolean algebra, and, and how that logic flows to compute pretty much uh, any, any numerical uh, computational uh, solution. You put those together, you get to create the transistor-based computer. Uh, you also get to create the transistor-based radio. But when you really look at the, the histories here, the breakthrough in the computing world accelerated our, uh, our ability to attack those problems and create a computational, uh, you know, it's a watershed moment uh, for, for uh, the work that we do there. And you can just see the, uh, again, the invention. And these, are, these are, are, are creations of devices, but they really, they represent some of the breakthroughs in how we, uh, we use the transistor to manipulate information. Meanwhile, though, I argue that uh, we actually slowed down in a lot of those kind of fundamental breakthroughs uh, in, uh, in RF. We kind of just did the same thing for a long time by just being doing better engineering uh, using the transistor, uh, but not really changing how we approach this. Um, and by the way, I also have a, a variation of this theme for radar, and there's actually a very similar uh, argument to be made there. Um, until some of the breakthroughs that we had in the software-defined radio world. Uh, and, and I point out here in 2001, the GNU radio space, um, that probably shouldn't maybe be more generically uh, and more representative of the larger software radio uh, world uh, in general, but, but by, by really combining the use of the transistor as a numerical device to, for computation and the transistor as an RF device for amplification, you mix those together, you get software-defined radio. And that's leading us towards a highly uh, uh, flexible, uh, highly performant as we're, we're, we're moving farther into the future ability to control this, uh, the, the electromagnetic spectrum and to, as I say, program uh, the electromagnetic spectrum uh, to whatever we need to do. So if you look at what 5G is doing today, the parameter space that's available is massive. Uh, and then 6G, it's gonna be bigger. And how do we actually uh, manage all that? Through computational interfaces and through the software-defined radio uh, models. So from there, I wanna go into a couple of, uh, of examples of programs that we've run at, at uh, DARPA in the past few years uh, that have started to uh, enable us to break this open even further. So I've already gone through a little bit of the history here. So, not, so I don't wanna uh, double tap that, except to say that by the time we created GNU Radio, uh, the Joint Tactical Radio, radio System, uh, JTRS was a military push. Vanu uh, came out of, uh, of MIT with his dissertation and created the, his company. Uh, all going after this more programmable surface of the software-defined radio. So as we walk through the next couple of uh, decades, we find that there's uh, new approaches to, to the computational uh, models here. So not just uh, a, uh, an x86 processor, the general purpose processor. Uh, you also had JTRS mostly going after the FPGA as uh, to, to get that, that low size, weight, and power uh, requirements that we needed for the military. But now you have this space of heterogeneous computation. Uh, we've got lots of examples uh, uh, from there. Uh, one of them was a program we started a couple of years ago called the Domain Specific System on Chip to really launch our, uh, our ability to, to utilize heterogeneous processing uh, because different processors are good for different things, uh, for different math problems. Uh, and and software-defined radio represents a number of math problems. Uh, and so you've got this, uh, what we came into in, uh, last year, what we called the fourth generation of software-defined radio. Uh, and that was to take the programmability that GNU Radio enabled us. So it was a very, it was very uh, efficient programming environment, but not particularly efficient execution environment by just running on x86 processors uh, or ARM processors. SDR 4.0 uh, in the fourth generation is, is combining those to allow us to offload from that programming environment of GNU Radio to the execution environment of heterogeneous processing. And so when we did that, we, uh, we created the ability to, uh, to abstract the difficulties of the underlying architecture, the plumbing of moving between different uh, uh, processing domains, uh, left that to the GNU Radio scheduler and just allowed the programmer to decide which pro uh, processor was required for a particular uh, event. This is now baked into GNU Radio. So GNU Radio uh, version 3.10 has a lot of the, the, uh, the, the mechanisms here enabling this type of, uh, of processing. Uh, and so uh, you can see here, before we did this down here, the processing was only about 40-ish percent uh, on average of what we were uh, able to take advantage of in the, in the computer. It meant that 60% of the time the processors were bored waiting for data. Uh, after SDR 4.0, by taking advantage of, of the data offload and management of the data flow, 
uh, we get to spend a lot more time just focus on the processing. And that includes GPUs, FPGAs, and other types of heterogeneous processing. So now we have a, uh, a platform to both program uh, and execute. So that's really exciting. And the fact that we push this out into the GNU Radio uh, open source community for, uh, for us to continue that, that uh, speed of, of development and exploration of new radio techniques. So I wanna end here uh, in my talk by talking about another program uh, that we've, uh, we're currently running at DARPA called the Open Programmable Accelerated 5G or OPA 5G. This one was all about how do we understand the utility of 5G for, uh, uh, for the military uh, soldiers and Marines and warfighters. Uh, if we were to use this in the field, uh, that could represent a significant threat from a, a, an attack surface. So we wanted to understand what that attack surface looked like. Uh, and to do that, we created a large uh, core of government labs uh, from, we have uh, you know, Army, Air Force, Navy, uh, representation uh, uh, throughout this program, looking at what are their equities and what are their concerns. And then on the other side, we had the development of an open source software implementation of a 5G uh, radio access network. So both the UE, the user equipment, uh, the handset, and the base station are now uh, fully uh, an open source implementation of these for 5G. This is gonna allow us to explore and measure and monitor every aspect, every layer of the protocol stack. Uh, it's gonna allow us to reconfigure these devices much more quickly to understand, again, what the, the challenges are and what the design of our defenses uh, are gonna be uh, by having visibility, having uh, an open programmable system. So uh, we released the first uh, implementation of this using the non-standalone 5G in 2021. Uh, we, have, we will be releasing a, an SA version, so we'll have both UE and a an, uh, Genode B SA standalone uh, uh, coming out this month. Uh, so we're continuing to accelerate that work and produce uh, capabilities that are going to be far more extensible beyond what we're doing just in the Starper program from that defensive side and, and enabling us to, uh, to grow the community of knowledge of users, uh, innovation that can sit on top of this 5, you know, 5G uh, open source stack uh, and, uh, and continue to, to accelerate our innovation. Uh, now, I, I do wanna mention, we're also running a program. I don't have a slide on this. I just thought of it today because we're doing a program review. Uh, another aspect of the future of programming the electromagnetic spectrum is, uh, is using beam forming, spatially uh, diverse uh, diversification and orthogonality so that you can reuse spectrum and you can, you can put more capacity out there. It's a big deal in 5G. It's gonna be a bigger deal in 6G. Uh, what we're doing in this program called uh, Triad, Tensors for Reprogrammable Intelligent Array Systems, or sorry, Tensors for Reprogrammable Intelligent Array Demonstrations, is to build systems that can demonstrate the use of GPUs and tensor programming to manipulate the beamforming of, uh, of an array of antennas. Uh, and there's going to be some exciting work coming out of there. Uh, much of it is, is actually uh, being developed as open source software and will be pushed into the open source uh, community as well. And so with that, I will end my talk and open up for questions. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. I think if you stop sharing, we can go to the questions. There you go. Excellent. So we do have a question. Uh, it's a broader question, uh, which says, how do you handle security? I mean, obviously, that's like a 10,000 foot question. But I think specifically, it was probably referenced in the, uh, in the, in, in the latest development on, on the radio side. So yeah, <clears throat> so security is it's a huge thing. You know, when people ask, are you going to secure the system? You got to ask, what do you mean by secure? Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a multifaceted uh, dimension. Um, so let me try to quickly hit a number of things we're doing from a, you know, a hardening of the code and a, you know, a, a cyber security perspective. Um, we are working with best practices. We're building the, the standard governance and, and maintenance of the source code. 
Uh, and of course, uh, uh, working with Linux Foundation from the OSSF, uh, you know, the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, using as much of that as possible to create good, you know, best practices from the community, uh, continuous integration, continuous de deployment, and of course, mixed in with that uh, means continuous testing. Uh, so we're doing a lot of testing on the digital side, uh, quality assurance and unit testing. We're actually doing a lot of uh, testing on the RF side. So actually having um, analog interfaces to our, our SDRs uh, so that we can actually explore a variety of, uh, of aspects there as well. Um, so that's one, one thing. The security on the RF side is we're looking at, uh, again, standard taxonomies of attacks that happen uh, on the RF uh, space. We actually uh, are using a, a standard Cisco uh, uh, model for this, uh, bucket into you know, denials of authentication, denials of service, um, jamming uh, type approaches, and, and building up that taxonomy and then trying to tackle the ones that we're hearing from our end users, the services, uh, what, um, uh, uh, what equities they're really concerned about, and then, it, then developing uh, experiments uh, and a test bed to specifically tackle those. And then once we understand that, we can figure out, is it implementation in the code or the device? Is it a protocol problem that we can work with the 3GPP to, to understand? Or is it a network configuration problem that we can work with either the service providers or if we're using it ourselves as a private network, we can, uh, we can work around. So those are variations on the theme of, of security that we're interested in. Wow, that, uh, and each of these could go on for days. So I, I, no, that's a very good broad answer. Um, there's one more question. Are there specific applications or use cases you're looking at, uh, you know, whether it's in the battlefield or in facilities in terms of scenarios that you consider for, for, the, for the overall uh, uh, e ecosystem or architecture? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's a number of scenarios and we're working very closely with uh, the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. So uh, I'll just refer to it as the, the Pentagon uh, project. So the Pentagon has launched a number of 5G efforts. Uh, if you read about them in the news, you'll hear maybe some of the 5G bases or the tranches because we, we uh, executed them in, in a couple of different uh, tranches of funding. Uh, we're tied in closely with that uh, community to look at what they're developing for their use cases on the bases. So smart depots, uh, rapid redeployment scenarios. So how do you uh, uh, quickly understand the you know, logistics train of, I need to outfit uh, a Marine company, I need to outfit a ship, uh, and how do you actually move that quickly throughout? Uh, so those are some of the, the uh, deployments that we care about here from just managing our resources uh, and, and our inventory as, as uh, best as possible. In the field, what I'm concerned about is it's too easy to reach for our phones. We're, we all know that we're addicted to our phones. We all know that they're, they're incredible devices to get us information and con to connect us. Uh, we also say we, we want to fight like we train or we want to train like we fight uh, so that you, you're used to how you're going to behave in the field. Um, you're going to therefore fall into the trap of trying to use your cell phone. And you want that. You want that information and access. Um, if that's going to happen, we need to understand what those challenges are going to be and how can we utilize that to our, the best of our uh, ability. Uh, so these are security issues that we have in the field. Uh, we're trying to make sure we understand them and can give our soldiers the best protection and understanding of that environment that they can have. Uh, so there's a direct uh, relationship to our, our operations around the world uh, and our ability to utilize these uh, commercial devices for our ability to, to maneuver uh, and survive when we do that. Wow, it's amazing how you know use cases uh, move well beyond uh, you know YouTube's and 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 cell phones and webs and and you know into IoT and machine to machine and all that. So you know it's built on fundamental architecture. Yeah, our, it's the exciting thing about five G and future G work is is moving beyond that service model of just getting raw you know data to a, a user. It's getting all that sensor data, all of that mechanism, all the mechanics that are going to be enabled through wireless connectivity, uh, and redeploying that for all sorts of scenarios. For us, we have military applications for uh, commercial world, the industry. 4.0 type of uh, approaches. Really good uh, um, place to look at dual use of this technology. Very nice. Uh, and again, I want to personally thank DARPA and all the research that has been going on, whether it's, you know, vaccines to 5G to security and, and you know, really excited. The future is bright with, you know, smart people like you all. So appreciate your talk and your insights. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Arthur.